Hi everyone, your chess puzzler here, and welcome to the channel. It's the World Chess Championship, and it's crunch time. Today, it's round three of many. Do we hope to see Magnus and Napo take it all the way and play all 14 rounds? What we saw in the first two games, and especially the game of round two, was phenomenal. Nepo took a quite comfortable lead and somehow along the way Nepo in a way lost all his advantage and allowed Magnus to come back right into the game. I think if you look back at the game of round two that move to c3 by Nepo is what really really allowed Magnus to come back. We showed by a few moves earlier was also something Nepo could have avoided he could have taken on a4, and even if Magnus would have eliminated the pawn on c4 with a queen, he could have tried, well, we're talking about Nepo, Nepo could have tried straight c5, and Magnus would be suffering. When I cut the game, all this, of course, was left out. It's simply impossible to cover every single move. And by this I mean... In the time frame we have. Also remember with each move you can end up with entirely different variations. I hope you understand what I'm talking about. Anyways, game two was epic. But do allow me to add something else. Look at how different game one was to game two. Nothing like what we saw in the world championship. You see Magnus and Fabi. Do we like it this way? Well, I do, but not everyone is sharing the same thoughts. Okay, we have game three that is just about to kick off. So let me bring up this diagram. Let us add all the necessary details and let's hope we shall see an equally exciting game as that of round two. Now, before I forget, tomorrow the round of games played. Round four will be played on the Tuesday, the 30th. And for those who know the dates, <laughs> let's ask Magnus why Tuesday is a special day for him. Wouldn't it be ironic if he loses a game on this very important date? Napo, this side, and we have an E for opening. Magnus. Answers with e5, and this has to be something similar we saw in game one. Well, let's see. Knight f3, knight c6, yep, another Spanish. Bishop is attacked. Napo backs him off. Magnus develops the other knight, and we see castles. So, with this bishop response, rook e1, b5. We should be three. Magnus here castles. And no h3 like we saw in game one, but Nepo challenges this guy on b5. You do not normally trade, but the move to go for here is this push to b4. Now that h3 may still appear, but let's see. Magnus here develops a bishop. We see this push to e3. And with d6, this is how Nepo does his thing. Knight d2. Do you expect these two to follow main line? Then, you know, you wouldn't expect anything else. Well, in the meantime, expect them is to come in very fast. And they are coming in pretty quickly. Only because what you see here is tried and tested. And Magnus goes for rookie eight. Nepo transfers the knight towards the king's side, and these two know exactly what they're doing. How many games with these same exact moves have been played? Now, later on, of course, when we do get to see something relatively new, the game will slow down. That's a guarantee. And that's why these people are playing fast now to spend more time thinking later on. This knight in F1 will transfer to. The third, I'm not quite sure whether it's G3 or this side of the board. 
And then Nepal hopes to be able to find a way to the opposing king. Magnus knows this, and this may explain what you just played. It was this fully defensive move. It may be unusual to go for this move right now, but if the world champ plays it, then it should be okay. Bishop d2, getting ready to clear the first, and things are beginning to slow down here. Backing off the bishop to the last has to be the number one response in this position. What does Magnus go for? It was bishop f8. Knight e3, Magnus transfers his troops towards his king's side. Nepo here shoots off with this guy, and this game now may open up. Doesn't have to though. It all depends on how Magnus plays it, and of course, how Nepal plays it. Okay, he chooses to trade here. How would you capture this guy? Well, Nepal used the knight, and if and he's now probably looking at charging after this bishop on b7, knight c6, stopping knight a5, Nepal here goes for this response. And with Magnus now cutting off the access to a5 in this way, he also knows Nepal can't break through using the queen's side. Nepal went bishop c3. He knows this bishop can't be touched, or can't be bothered. And bishop c3 looks like a very natural move. It's going to be a very slow and very difficult game. Both are out of prep. They're both are now taking their time. With this bishop on b7 not doing much, Magnus releases his control on c6. But before the knights can be in danger, both the knight in c4 and bishop on c3, they have to move away from there. Now, this bishop repositioning to the eighth closes one door but opens another. At some stage, that h3 may be necessary. And yet, against these odds, Nepal conjures up another something. He went for this break. And because you don't want to have d5, this guy came off. And Nepal is burning time to see how best to capture. He has to use the knight, but does he? He just did. And with two more knights coming off, there is no doubt how you must capture. If you use the bishop, this central pawn will perish. And for what? So now that we provided a very simple explanation why the queen needs to capture, when Nepal went for this, with the exception of one minor piece located on the sixth, every single piece located on the board when it comes to Magnus is stuck on the last. Visually, Nepal's position looks superior. But there might be a big difference between what looks and what is. This guy on a5 is in a way hanging, but it will be a big inaccuracy even to look at him. Later, if things change, this guy can go down. Magnus here developed, or shall we say, better repositioned the bishop here. It's a pretty solid move. It stops the knights from going places. If you, for example, take on a5, do expect to get confronted by this attack. And if you back off the queen here, if you take and take, once this guy also goes, Magnus will be having a field day. Everything breaks wide open here. And Magnus will make an easy meal out of you or anyone else. Let's come back to see how the game really progresses. Okay, very delayed h3, and this has to come out of nowhere with this position. Magnus here went for something very similar to what we saw earlier. He hunts after the queen. Nepal backs her off here. There are now ideas of chasing after the bishop with the rook. Let's see what Magnus does. Okay, we have a move. It's not rook b8, but it's this push to c6. Magnus is now therefore looking at d5, but he's never going to let him. 
Bishop c2, getting out of any unwanted pins. Magnus does bring up d5. And now we do have a situation. Knight b6 for sure to this attack. And the knight goes and for what? So obviously no knight b6, but Nepal muddies the waters. You can't expect at this level to fall for elementary mistakes. If you back off the knight, you will have something else coming at you. Go after the queen, back her off here. And once you get this attack going, rest assured to become now toast. Lose the bishop, and this will be the end of this game. Even if you try e5, take the bishop, take the knight, once the queen's also the part, once another knight becomes toast, next is one of these two rocks, and there you go. So coming back, what may work is exactly how Nepal plays it. He reciprocated the attack with e5. Magnus here eliminates the knight. Nepal has a number of options. He can easily take the knight on a six first, but it doesn't really matter how he plays it. He first traded the queen, and with the knight now coming off, you can either take on f6 or try g6 to close up the position. There is yet another something which I missed completely. Can you see what I missed? It was his move to b4 using the bishop, and this is exactly how Magnus plays it. It's a brilliant move. Let's see what it does. With this guy coming off, the bishops went. And with this guy additionally going, there is no need for anyone to move fast. They both have 12 moves to make time control. And Nepal has 38 minutes on his clock. And Magnus is a quarter of an hour. King f1, rook b8. The rook is challenged. Magnus marches with his majesty, both rooks disappear, and with Nepo coming up with his challenge, if the rooks also go, this will be definitely a draw. With Magnus accepting the challenge, everything is now really a matter of time. King e5, King e2, f5, Bishop c2, f4, Bishop c1, c5 and do expect to draw any time soon. Everything Nepal has is on squares Magnus can't get to and Magnus has exactly the same thing with his, well look at his pawns. With a repeat move these have to be the signs. Bishop d7, f3, king f6, h4 to stop the king's access to the king's side, king e5, king f2, king f6, king e2, king e5, king f2, and the game ends here in yet another draw. Was this game spectacular? For sure, he had his moments, but was it worthy of a championship game? Well, at least we have... We are looking forward to the game of round four, which comes up next when these two play again. Tomorrow is a day off for the players to look back and reflect, but whatever happens, these games are on. So game four is on Tuesday, and both are in it to win it. Your chess puzzle are here, and you know the drill. Safety always first.